Sam Wood, welcome to the Dom Harvey podcast. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, great to meet little Kanye. Oh yeah, Kanye. He will be. Um, he will stand here with us for the duration of this chat. At some point, he might jump up on your lap. Uh, you might look around and think he's not in here, but he'll just be under my seat. He's um, he's never far from my side. I, I wouldn't have it the other way. How are you? Welcome to New Zealand. Mate, I'm great, and it's so beautiful to be here. I've, uh, I'm from Tassie originally, and the amount of people have said to me, oh, New Zealand and Tassie, there's a lot of similarities, and we're staying down there by the by the water, and uh, yeah, went for a big run this morning, and I can see what people are saying. It's got Hobart waterfront vibes, that's for sure. Right. What else? What else is similar? The incest? <laughs> no, no, I'm no comment. No comment. No, no. I've, I've, I moved to Melbourne twenty years ago, yeah. and I got plenty of that early on. So, um, where did you run this morning? Just along the, um, uh, just along the dock there. Yeah, yeah not nothing. Uh, probably nothing compared to what you do. Yeah, well, what I did, did eight k's. So eight k's. Oh, that's that, a good that, trot. That was that was a nice little nice little trot. Yeah, that, that's one thing that drew me to to running, just the simplicity and ease of it. Like wherever you are in the world, you yeah. can just um. I mean, you, you, shoes aren't even mandatory. You can go without shoes if you want. Um, but it's so simple, so easy. Great great way to see a new city as well. Best, best yeah. way to see a place. And it's, uh, I don't know, we've spoken at dogs as well. Do- uh, walking my dog and running are my two meditations, I reckon. I don't not really typically do the, the meditation thing, but those two things and just switching off are my two things for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm so excited to have you over. Really looking forward to cracking into this chat. I thought we could um, do a structure in sort of three sort of chapters. Okay. Um, chapter one, the Bachelor stuff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Your your uh, your dark reality TV past. <laughs> uh, chapter two, we'll go back to Sam pre Bachelor. Sure. And then uh, chapter three, post Bachelor, which is where we're at now. Absolutely. No. Okay. That's, that's a good way of doing it. I like yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's probably some people listening to listening to this or watching this that know you from um, the Bachelor that'll be excited about that. Um, but with what you've done since then, it's it's really just like a footnote in your story, isn't it? Yeah, a very important one. I mean, people sort of say to me flippantly a little bit, like, oh, do you regret doing The Bachelor and that kind of stuff? And the answer is absolutely not. It's <laughs> without doubt the best thing that I've ever done. I didn't, I didn't enjoy the experience that much. It was a bit, a bit contrived and, you know, you've... You're filming for 16, 17 hours a day, most days, seven days a week, 16 uh, weeks I was away from home. And, uh, you know, TV, for those that have experienced it behind the scenes, is, you know, there's a lot of fluffing around for not much content in the end. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a pretty painful process well, but wait, wait a minute are you telling us the rose ceremony isn't done in real time <laughs> <laughs> no everything is strung right out and there were some seriously late nights and a lot of times i think gosh surely we can just wrap this up but you sort of just have to suck it up and it was a it was a brilliant learning experience it was a really good test for me of sort of patience and getting to know myself a bit better um you know, really getting out of my comfort zone, really getting comfortable talking about things that I typically wouldn't talk about even with a mate, let alone in front of millions mm. of people and, you know, 20 cameras. So I, I'm, I really feel like I evolved enormously from that experience as a person comfortable with vulnerability, talking about my relationships and, and feelings and all that kind of stuff, stuff that blokes are typically not that great at. And most importantly, I met my now amazing wife. We've got four daughters. So for those that uh, have no idea what I'm talking about, I was on The Bachelor in 2015. It was the third season of The Australian Bachelor. I'd never seen the show before. And a client of my gym would pester me about being single and getting a girlfriend and all this kind of stuff. And she basically said i'm gonna i'm gonna apply for you i'm gonna start filling out your form and you're gonna go on this show and i was like oh don't be ridiculous <laughs> kelly this, i'm not going on this show i've seen the ads on tv but that was as far as my knowledge went and she came round <clears throat> behind reception of my gym googled how you apply for the bachelor started filling out this form you know asking me questions then she went and trained said you make sure you fill the rest of these details out and lo and behold, the phone rang the next day and I sort of, you know, private number and I answered it and they said, oh, hi, we got your application for the show. We're really interested in talking to you. Can we do a Skype interview? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And we did a 60-minute Skype. I think it was two days later. And then two days after that, 
Sam, we really like the Skype interview. We want to fly you to Sydney and uh, we want to interview you. And I was still a little bit naive about it all. And it's all I, very fast moving. Very fast. And I sort of went, oh, I don't know how many people they'd be flying into Sydney, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I flew up, had my flip-flops, as you guys call them, my thongs on, my jeans, my T-shirt. I was all pretty relaxed about it all. And I walked into this room and it was full of all these suits, TV execs, big cameras on. Um, and then there's about... 15 people in this room and they spoke to me for about an hour and a half with the cameras on. And I was like, oh, this is far more sort of advanced and full on than I'd perhaps anticipated. And as I was leaving, I remember one of the heads of Channel 10 in Australia sort of, uh, he sort of grabbed me by the arm and as I was leaving, he said, don't go doing anything rash and, you know, getting any crazy mohawks or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I think, you, I think it's a pretty safe bet. And sort of gave him a wink and walked off and caught a plane back to Melbourne. And um, about 10 days later, I got a phone call saying, mate, you're it. We've chosen you, but you've got to pack up your life in Melbourne, move to Sydney for four months, and you can't tell a soul why you're going there and where you're going. And I was like, oh. Jesus, I had a gym, I had a kid's fitness business. Um, so that was, it was that sort of really, that was the poignant moment of, well, what do I do here? I don't really know what I'm doing. I didn't ever think I'd get accepted. Now there's a decision to make. Yeah, it's a long time to put your life on hold, eh? Yeah, and it was also, then I did start to think about, God, what what is this show? What are the <laughs> consequences of this show? The guy that had done it the year before, it had been an absolute balls up. Oh, I was going to ask you about yeah. this. Where you fit into it? So you were on in so, 2015. Was the one before you with um, Nick Cummins, Honey Badger? No, 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 he was well after me. Right, but so he got si slaughtered. For he me. did a similar sort of outcome. The guy before me was a guy by the name of Blake, who chose someone, and then the show that went to air, and then he backflipped on his decision and broke up with that girl and started texting the girl that came second for want of a better oh. expression oh. and was voted most hated man in Australia, <laughs> was basically <laughs> banished from the country. And so I'd sort of heard these stories. I was like, Jesus, if it goes pear-shaped, it really does go badly. So, you know, you start to have these, not 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 doubts, but you've you, you got to realise Think of worst case scenarios. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, course. a little bit. But more more for me it was like if i don't do this now i will forever wonder what if and i'll just it'll be really hard to sort of live with that what if mm. so i jumped in i called my best mate and uh i called my dad they were the two people that i told and um and off i went and i remember uh about a day before we started shooting the executive producer sean great guy um, I really got a lot of comfort by sort of spending time with him and chatting with him. He said, mate, I've just heard you've never seen an episode. Like, you've seen some bits of some episodes. <laughs> I said, mate, I promise you I've never seen one minute of the show outside of an ad on that comes up on the ad breaks. And he was like, oh, shit, that's, that's, that's risky. Anyway, he said, let's just... Let's just start filming tomorrow as scheduled and if it's a total dog's breakfast, we might have to pause filming and you might have to do a bit of homework to understand exactly how the show sort of flows and what actually happens on this thing because he said, mate, this is a big beast. Once it goes, it goes. I don't think you quite realise the enormity of it all. Anyway, we started filming and it got to the end of that first night of, you know, a cocktail party where 22 girls walk down a driveway and I get out of limos and I meet them all and I have to remember everybody's name and there's yeah. lights and cameras everywhere. It was full on. Yeah, by, by the way, that would give me like so much anxiety. Oh, I was. Do you have someone yeah. in your ear reminding you of names? Or? Yeah, a little bit, but it's there's a lot going on. You know, girls are coming up to you and grabbing you and wanting to have a conversation and they're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to remember not only their name but where they're from and a little bit of information about them and it's a lot and uh it got to the end of the filming the first night and sean said mate that's the best and i said what do you mean he said you've got no preconceived ideas you're not trying to be here to be famous you just you're a bit of a dork <laughs> and you're here being oh. yourself like in the night i used to meaning it as a compliment i think <laughs> and um and he said he said you're not going to watch it let's just let's just roll with it and then you know, it, it, you know, The Bachelor's The Bachelor. It's a crazy circus. But Snajana, 
this Macedonian girl from Perth who had a nine-year-old daughter, I just clicked with and really started to fall for. And, um, and yeah, so all I wanted to do was spend more time with her. That was really hard because you've obviously got to do what the show requires yeah, you format, to do and so, yeah. go on different dates <laughs> with different girls and different dates with different girls, you know. And I think because of the season before me, they – they thought, oh, well, he might change his mind. And I, I was sort of saying, guys, I'm not going to change my mind. Right? Like, I'm, I'm pretty decisive once once I stick to something. And they uh, they were like, oh, we'll, we'll be the judge of that after last year, you know, you, you <laughs> see all this kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I started to fall in love with Snez and find out about her little nine-year-old daughter, Evie. And, um, and, yeah, the rest is history. We're now married. We've got four kids and it's... Uh, been been a crazy adventure ever since. It's a it's a brilliant love story. Yeah, there's actually um a New Zealand uh, bachelor couple who have a similar sort of story. Art and Matilda. Oh, I've heard Art, Art, Art Green, Green and Matilda yeah, Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, he's, there's a lot of parallels with you and him. Like he's he's mad into the fitness scene. Yeah, as right, well. right. Um, but yeah, they are. She um, because sneeze. Yes. Is that how you say Snezhana, it? Snezhana. Yeah, she's Snezhana. Macedonian. Yeah. So she was first out of the car on the she the was night. Oh, yeah, she was. And you, you, did you feel something then, or were you just like overstimulated and? Well, I can't did. Sort of I did, but I was. I mean, you say the anxiety about the names. I was. I was a little overwhelmed at that stage. Like it was kind of you know tuxedo on, lights, camera, action, and this car pulls up, and bang, and I was like, oh, this is this is how it works. I didn't know if it was five girls. I didn't know if it was ten girls. It turned out to be twenty-two <laughs> girls. So I was really trying to compute what the hell was going on here. It was a lot to take in. But even amongst that madness, I was like, "Oh, there's something like about you that you know intrigues me." Yeah, that's uh, the same sort of thing with Art and Matilda. Yeah, uh, right. Art, Art said to the producers early on, "Oh, yeah, she's the one." And they're like, yeah. no, 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 hold your horses. Yeah. <laughs> this is episode one. We need to go through the process. Yeah. Um, but he sort of, he, that must make it hard doing a show like that when you've sort of got this um, idea in your mind that that's the one I like. Well, I hated it from the other girls' perspectives because I felt like... They never had a shot. Yeah, and you, you're not being fully honest, you know. Like, and they sort of say, look, just have a great time with this person. You don't have to overcommit in the thing that you say, but, you, you know, you they're here. You've got to sort of be fully present. When, and I said, absolutely, of mm. course. I'd be terribly disrespectful not to do that. But I really had sort of worked it out in my head that, you know, nothing's going to change here mm. that sort of changes my mind. And, uh, and yeah, that's how it panned out. Were you sort of giving um, Sneeze like a, a nudge and a wink? Like, don't worry, you're getting a rose tonight. Well, they were very quick to pull us apart when the cameras weren't on. You should have seen it. It was just like, get them away from each other. Like the, the, all the producers and stuff had rushed in at a million rate of knots to uh, pull you apart. Yeah. yeah, and did you, throughout the process, did you like hook up or kiss with any other girls? Well, you do because it's sort of what the show is. You have to. So, yeah, you have to. Well, I, it, it sounds horrendous even saying that, doesn't it? But uh, the the hardest thing was watching the show back, and you know, I I sort of I'd get together with my mates. So I was still in Melbourne. Snez was in Perth, and Perth's two hours behind, um, or three hours in daylight savings. Uh, Melbourne time so it would come on at 7.30 in Melbourne and be two hours behind and so I'd watch it and I'd see what comes out on that episode and I'd text and go you probably don't want to watch tonight's episode <laughs> and she'd be like why why don't I want to watch this it, that, there's a, it's a weird sort of it's like point like, in time when that's happening it's like you're being unfaithful in a well, way it's, but, yeah, yeah but it's already happened it yeah. happened before we got together but it's sort of it's playing out after we've gotten together it was it it's was not a nice thing to watch yeah same sort of thing with art and matilda here yeah right it's bloody crazy and how um how did life change change afterwards in terms of like the level of fame and stuff i mean i suppose you're in a good position to handle it because you're a 35 year old man you've, you've been through a lot in your life so you're, you're well equipped to deal with what's happening next but the the australian media they can be quite savage right oh uh, yeah it was i agree with you i think i'm very grateful that i was a bit older and sort of a bit bit more comfortable in my own skin perhaps i, I think it could chew you up and spit you out pretty quickly mm. but like i literally went from complete obscurity to walking down the street and there'd be 
20 metre billboards at my face and behind every bus, every tram, every train, every TV ad, every radio ad. Couldn't walk down the street without 50 people asking me for a selfie. Paparazzi would be camped outside my house, camped outside my gym. They'd follow my friends around. Like, it was full on. And it's really full on in that there was a bit of a th- there was a three month delay between when we finished filming and when it went to air, so that period is really hard because they're so desperate to get a scoop on who you chose by somehow seeing you together or leaking that you know they follow you around very intensely yeah, to try yeah. and sort of crack it crack it open and get paid all this money to break the story. So how how did you? Um, keep the relationship going at that time was it just like remotely uh, with phone yeah, calls yeah it was yeah a lot of phone calls the the studio um, would let us catch up every four weeks in person so they'd fly me into Sydney on one day they'd fly Snezh into Sydney from Perth on another we weren't allowed to fly in on the same day in case people sort of tracked the flights oh, so, so, so they managed the whole logistics oh yeah it was like oh. born identity type stuff she'd get in her car <laughs> with tinted windows she'd go through a car park there'd be a car swap they'd drive us out I'm not even making this shit up it was crazy they'd drive us out to a Airbnb out in complete remote country Australia <laughs> We'd spend 24 hours together and then they'd fly her back and they'd fly me back. It was like a four-day uh, stealth operation for 24 hours together just so we could see each other and keep in touch in, in the flesh. But it was, um, yeah, it was, it was madness. Yeah, so and you, you mentioned before she had, um, she, or she's got a daughter, Eve. Who yeah. Is, uh, so Eve's like 17, 18? 18, yeah. So she was like 10 at the time, nine? She, yeah, she was nine, nine. and when, they, when Snez and Eve moved to Melbourne, she just turned 10. Right, yeah. so did she, did she watch the show? Was she allowed to watch the show? Well, it was actually her idea that Snez went on it. So she sort of pushed mum to go on this show and you should do it. Bit, for a bit of a laugh, I think, for both of them more than anything. I don't think they ever quite envisaged it could have worked out how it did but she'd have to go to school and everyone was watching the show and saying has your, your mum still has your mum come home yet oh what's going on oh yeah she must do well like she was a vault Evie was an absolute vault she'd get pestered by the teachers pestered by the other parents at school drop off like what's going on with your mum it was it was uh yeah she sort of t- retells the story that it was like a really full on time for a nine year old kid just be bombarded with these questions as people were just so obsessed with the show but um yeah she's now my little girl and yeah we're great friends and she's a ripper oh that's amazing god that's it's such a cool story eh just the way everything's panned out yeah crazy I mean, um yeah married at first sight is, is an absolute laugh yeah. <laughs> I, I love watching it but anyone that goes on there thinking they're trying tr- trying to find true love is uh, is delusional oh, i agree um, but, but i feel like the bachelor they they have had a reasonable sort of success rate and it makes sense right like if you put you in a room with 20 other people there's bound to be someone that you have some sort of connection with yeah i don't know what the what the success rate is in new zealand but in australia there's been god i think there's been 10 seasons and it's been three success stories. So that's pretty good, really. Mm. I mean, I hoped I would meet someone. But if you'd ask me really honestly, do you think you will? I would have said, well, probably not. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a long odds, shot yeah, still. Yeah. But, um, yeah, three. There's something, something really funny about going through that experience together. Like, it's, a, it's an experience that so few other people could really understand or you can even explain to them it's incredibly unique isn't yeah it? so the fact you go through it together and then you you kind of got to sort of draws you really close as you as you're sort of navigating your way through it and there, there's something really sort of special mm. about that I, I know some people go one way and they they love the newfound fame and they go to the opening of all these events like well <laughs> i was sort of the opposite i was all like, i just want to spend time with my family my close friends who know the real me, and Snez. and it, and so it sort of it sort of brings you brings you the other way. Mm. How how did you not get wrapped up in the um in the you know, the trappings or baubles or whatever you want to call it of um, <laughs> celebrity life? Oh, uh, it, it was never really. You know, there's bits of it that I like. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's it. I, you know, and I I never sort of forget where it's all come from, and um, you know it. it I don't know. Yes, it can be good for the ego a little bit, but I maybe it's that age and maturity thing. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I just. I just wanted to spend time with Snez. 
obviously get to know Evie. You know, we haven't been going out and partying. We've had three more kids, so you know, like it's been staying home and partying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's been you know, it's just it's been such a wild ride, and and also then the business stuff happened, and um, you know, I already had businesses, so for me, you kind of crave the normality a little mm. bit, and uh, because we were doing the remote thing for that first three months, that was that was sort of challenging in itself, but once once there's moved to Melbourne. I don't know. I was just really ready to settle down and, and for the three of us mm. to become a little family. That's what I was looking forward to. Yeah, that's really cool. Why why had you not found love on your own? Is it because you were a personal trainer for your entire life. You're 35 when you go on The Bachelor. Were you, were you a man whore? Were you, no, an, were you an F boy? No, like I, most was, personal I, was, trainers I are. wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. Look, I dated girls and I would had girlfriends, you know, particularly in my 20s. I, uh, you know, some long term, I, I don't know that I broke up with a girl in my late twenties and sort of, that was a bit of a, I need to maybe be by myself for a little while and get to know myself a little mm. bit. I'd kind of, I, I hadn't really realized it perhaps at the time, but I'd always sort of had a girlfriend, you know, from sort of 18 to 30 mm. and it was maybe not wanting to be by myself and I was pretty much single you know dated a couple of girls for a few weeks here and there perhaps you know through that sort of 30 to 35 period but i was sort of really enjoying being by myself for the first time in my life and i think that was pretty good for me and then um and then yeah i think it was just the perfect thing with snares and i think the other thing is snares is the same age as me and she's mature and strong and comfortable in her own skin and all qualities that really attracted me to her and there were younger girls on the show who were very different to talk to and approach the whole sort of environment and situation very, very differently. And there was something about snares being, so, you know, a lot of them were complaining about, I don't know, being away from their favourite cafe for weeks or something. And snares <laughs> had left her nine-year-old daughter for the first time in her life <laughs> as a single <laughs> mum. And I'm like, the only person here that really should be stressing about what they're left behind is you and you seem to not be you know like you're really calm and strong about it and that was something that i really admired from the start and i think the fact that we were both 35 and both knew what we wanted was was a really mm. big part of why we sort of were drawn to each other yeah it's funny how that serendipity thing just yeah. right place right person right time because you, so you're a personal trainer she's a scientist and yeah. a, a solo mum the chance of you meeting otherwise it never would have happened your paths never one in crossed. a billion it's yeah. crazy yeah yeah I mean, i've never been to Perth she'd never been to Melbourne like we were never meeting and without the mm. show that's for sure yeah okay so let, let's go all the way back so that, that's enough of the um the bachelor stuff <laughs> okay. that paints a really good uh, by the way you I can see why they um they gave you a zoom call the next day and then flew you to Sydney the day after you were perfect bachelor material <laughs> I'm guessing they had like a like a like a, a prototype table. or something like, no I'm guessing they had a maybe a coffee table with like 10 guys and they were like yeah they're, they're, they're all good possibles but we don't have the right guy yet and then your entry came in and they're like yes oh that's nice of this you this guy so. ticks all the boxes <laughs> so um so why why personal training what attracted you to that I've loved it, it um I've loved it since day one, Dom, to be honest. I, so I'm from Tassie. I came over to do my human movement degree to Victoria um, because you had to – a lot of people leave Tassie to do university or get a job. So I, I did that when I was 19. And um, I was actually up in Ballarat, sort of country Victoria, doing my first year of my degree. And a guy came up and did a talk to our first year uni students – and he painted this picture of this personal training studio that was a thousand square meters and had a 200 meter running track around the outside of the gym. He had 30 personal trainers and this was in 2000. So personal training wasn't that big then. Mm. Anyway, it, it sort of he, he was a brilliant guy and painted this brilliant picture. And I was like, wow, I've got to check this place out. So I'd ring, I'd, I called him up and said, can I do some work experience in the next university holidays? And he's like, oh, mate, I haven't had a great track record with, with this work experience, people, to be honest. I said, oh, I appreciate, you know, you being so honest. I said, but I promise I'll, I'll be different. And he said, oh, you're in Ballarat, I'm here in Melbourne. I don't really see how it's going to work. 
Anyway, I kept ringing him. I didn't take no for an answer. And he's like, oh, God, you're it's a It's like pers- the opposite of the bachelor's. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. He's he's a, you're, you're, you're a persistent little bugger. Anyway, <laughs> I, uh, he said, all right, come down. You can do a week in the next holidays. So I went down, found a place to crash on a, on a family friend's couch and uh, would go in there at 5 a.m. every morning, work till about 8 o'clock at night, just kept my mouth shut, absorbed as much information as I could, scrubbed toilets, did whatever was necessary. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the week, he said, if you're happy to transfer unis to a Melbourne uni, um, you, there's a job for you next year. And I said, consider it done. And I sort of walked in there. And I was still pretty young and, and fresh, but I just, I just knew this is something I'd really enjoy doing. I love working with people. I've always loved sport. Um, you know, I was a really skinny kid. I was the same height that I am now and sort of 30 kilos lighter and I was just starting to enjoy getting into the gym and seeing what changes it could create for me and how it was helping me build my confidence and all that kind of stuff. Loved weight training and loved learning about it. And, um, yeah, he gave me, it gave me a crack and it just, I just sort of took off. I just got really busy really fast and fell in love with it and yeah, did that. Did about 80 appointments a week for six years and then I started Australia's first ever kids' gym. Cause I'd, I'd so start, I'm going to pause you there. Yeah. Eight, 80 appointments a week? Yeah. For yeah, six years? Yeah. Yeah, I was 80 busy. 80 appointments a week. So how many days a week are you working? Uh, six. Six? Yeah, so I was busy. So like one hour appointments? Uh, 45 minutes 45 usually, minutes. Okay. yeah. So you're yeah. Starting, starting when? Like 5 a.m.? 5.30 and I'd do... I'd do pretty much till midday and then I'd have lunch and train myself and then what happened by accident was I started training kids I'd have a lot of parents and they'd say oh you don't do kids do you and I said yeah sure (laughs) and they said oh I've got a little boy who needs to lose a bit of weight and gain some confidence or wants to get drafted into the AFL or play cricket or whatever it was you know some were sort of athletic pursuits and others were a bit more aesthetic and next thing I'd have parents bring their kids out of school at midday, one o'clock, two o'clock, and see me for 45 minutes or an hour. And so where most trainers would have that gap in the middle of the day, because we weren't a CBD location, we were sort of on your way to work, after school drop off or on your way home. Um, I'd have kids in the middle of the day. So instead of sort of having a ceiling of 50 appointments a week, I'd do about 30 kids a week. So the, the, the money's... The, the, the money's good, I guess. Yeah. But, um, but it's it's limited to your time, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. How, I mean, how, how much are you making on a good week? Uh, 5,000? 6,000? Yeah, five grand a right. week as a 21-year-old at university. I was doing uni online at the same time. Oh, so, shit. So, yeah, she was busy times. But I loved it. I, lo- I couldn't get enough. I was so this you, kid you never, from Tassie who came over with, that, with about eight bucks right. in a crappy old Camry and all my life possessions in the boot. And my dad uh, is old school kind of you know once you're 18 sam you're on your own mate type thing you know like don't ask me for another cracker that's kind of how dad is and i always thought he was a bit hard at the time but i'm really grateful now and i just loved it i'm like i can't get enough of this i'm earning great money i'm meeting great people i'm learning lots i'm fascinated about having your own business and all that kind of stuff so yeah i was fully immersed in it You, you can't have had any sort of social life to speak of well, when you're 21, you still find a way, you know, <laughs> like you'd, you'd do that for s- six days and you'd still go out with friends on a Saturday night and be a bit scene. hangover on a Sunday and, you know, Monday morning the alarm goes off at 4.30, 5 o'clock and you do it all again. It's amazing how resilient you are. You're kind of mm. bulletproof. In my late 20s, it starts to catch up with you mm. a bit. But, yeah, in those first few years, it was it was full on, but I, it didn't seem to slow me down. But I, ju- I just loved it. And then th- that kid stuff i was just fascinated by how many children were benefiting from personal training but personal training is obviously quite expensive and not accessible for everybody so i started um australia's first ever kids gym and we did after school programs and birthday parties and holiday programs footy camps yeah 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 gecko that was gecko Gecko. Right? Yeah. yeah so um so that was 2006 so so the, the story goes um one of your clients, uh, very wealthy family, you were training their kid for like 300 bucks a morning, five mornings a week? <laughs> well, that was, the, you've done your research, Dom, I'm impressed. That, so that was actually the mum. Right. So I had it, there was a very uh, wealthy um, surgeon 
and he was a surgeon who had about 150 other surgeons working for him. He was a very wealthy man. He's a very wealthy man and just the loveliest guy ever. Anyway, he, he called me up when I was still doing the adults and the kids and he said, oh, I've got – my son's a tennis prodigy. I need, um, I need you to start training him. I've done my research and apparently you're the guy. I said, oh, yeah. I said, oh, wonderful. I can probably find another trainer to look after him. I said, but I'm, I, I'm full. Anyway, he said – well, what do you charge? And I said, oh, I don't know, $100 a session. And he said, I'll pay you 200 and I And he needs to see you four times a week. This is his nine-year-old son. And I said, oh, Jesus. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll find a way. <laughs> that, that's a bit too hard to turn down as a 24-year-old. Yeah. I said, all right. So I, Daniel came in, great kid. And I started doing, you know, footwork and conditioning work and rotation work for his tennis and... Um, great kid and David, beautiful man, lovely guy, as pushy as he was at that sort of first um, meeting, great guy. And we just developed a real friendship. I became really close with his family. Um, I'd train him sometimes. Um, I'd train his wife sometimes in the mornings. And um, then I, I started Gecko. I started in an old garage, but... It was a short lease because they were ultimately knocking that garage down to build apartments. So I could go get a pretty sort of quick, cheap lease for a couple of years to get Gecko off the ground. And when Gecko was going quite well, um, but we needed a new location, he invited. I'd, at that stage, I was training um, Lena, his wife, uh, every morning. She'd sort of said, Oh, Sam, I want to come in on my way to work. And I wasn't training all the adults in because I was focusing on, on the kids' stuff. And, um, and I said, oh, yeah, I can see in the mornings before I sort of start my gecko day, why don't you come in? So I'm training her in a kid's gym. Uh, but there's adults, you know, sort of, like, you can be versatile. She wasn't, you know, powerlifting 100 <laughs> kilos or anything. So there was plenty of equipment that w- would suffice to give her a good workout. And over time, I'd sort of say, look, you know, I, I can't train you anymore because I just, I've got too much too many commitments with the gecko stuff and I really need to focus on it and she she'd put her own prices up just so I wouldn't stop training her so eventually got to the point where I'd see her at seven o'clock every morning and she'd pay me three hundred dollars a session she'd pull into the car park in her convertible Ferrari she'd always be 15 minutes late so I'd only train her for 30 minutes (laughs) she'd pay me three hundred (laughs) dollars then she'd get back in a Ferrari and she'd go off to work it was ridiculous but but they were so beautiful to me as people I, I remember i was really stressed about finding a new location when that lease was coming up they had about six months left and i was going where am i going to where am i going to house this business and where are all these kids going to come and train and they invited me around to dinner and so I, i'd never been to their house before they've got a 40 million dollar house in turak it's like something you've never seen before you know, you, your eyeballs get scanned and this big door opens up. It's pretty, oh yeah, it's, 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 cra- it's crazy. <laughs> so suddenly you're thinking, 300 bucks a morning, I'm being underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't actually think that, but perhaps I should have. But they, um, they invited me to dinner and they said, Sam, we've been talking and we know how stressed you are. You've been so good to our family and we see you as part of our family. And if you need um, a building... Uh, to move Gecko to, we'll buy one. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, oh, well, you know, you can rent it off us, but we know there's not that much out there in the commercial rental space to sort of what you need where you need it, but you're probably easier to find one to buy. So two weeks later, I found a building for two and a half million bucks and they bought it. Without, like, sight unseen, charged me 100 grand rent, which is way under on wow. what it should have been. And let me keep my business going. And yeah, even later down the track, they invested in Gecko to help sort of Gecko expand into uh, franchising and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's a personal training. The thing I loved about personal training almost the most was the people that you make, the successful business people, they really care about you. They're just a wealth of knowledge. Mm. And, you know, you, you've just got this incredible network that genuinely cares about you and i think the fact i didn't come from money and i was kind of this kid that had come over from tassie having a bit of a crack they really liked that and i'm a pretty open person i'd you know if i was doing well i'd tell them i was doing well if i was not Strangling. doing well i'd tell them i yeah. wasn't doing well and i think they always liked that openness and that vulnerability and it's a i'm still incredibly close with that family and probably 10 others that i see on a regular basis you know 20 years later 
Yeah, well, I mean, you're a very you're, you're very handsome and you're a very likable person. So I'm mm. guessing that's a lot to be uh, part of the key of being a successful personal trainer. Oh uh, yeah, it? Just, it, you're yeah. being good company and having good chat. Yeah, it's so much. I mean, what trainers don't get is it's a lot less about biceps and abs yeah. as it is about emotional intelligence and caring and good communication and you know I think the biggest mistake personal trainers make is they're, they're you know they're a bit selfish and they they care about you for the two hours of 168 hours a week that you're seeing the client but they don't follow you up they don't you know work with you on your nutrition they don't you know I'd, I'd go and watch my kids in their school and in, you know into sport cross country if I was available you know I'd, mm. I'd always you know take a real interest in what these families were doing outside of the sessions that we had together and I think I think they really could see that that was genuine and appreciated it for sure yeah. oh, I can see why you were so successful um, but you you had this um this this hunger for more it seems like this entrepreneurial spirit or call it whatever you want so um, Gecko that we've talked about the first kids gym in Australia um, you expanded that ended up with 14 for a 40 in 18 months yeah, but it wasn't a wasn't a nice linear growth. It was an expensive, you know, roller coaster. We actually started. We licensed it, the program and the equipment and the the manuals and you know uniforms, all that to existing gyms, similar to Les Mills, but for kids. Mm -hmm. Obviously, much smaller, um, <laughs> and that was awesome at launch. But then these gyms have such high turnover of trainers. But what would happen is you'd go in to check and that trainer had now left. They'd gone, oh, you can run the kids' programs to someone new. Someone new had never had direct contact with me. The quality of the programs had dropped right off. The equipment was banged up and not packed away properly in the corner or the storeroom. Mm. And you could just sort of see the writing on the wall that oh, this is, you know, we'd bought hundred equipment kits and brought them in from China with little rowers and little bikes and little boxes. But like we'd I I tend to get a bit carried away. So we'd go, This is gonna be huge. We're gonna have this in uh, three hundred gyms around Australia and Asia and New Zealand. Oh God, I really got ahead of myself. And then it just it just wasn't working. I was like, oh no. And at this stage, this beautiful family was still investing in Gecko. They were but but I had to pay them back. They'd said to me, Sam, we'll bankroll you but if this thing falls apart, you got to pay us back. And being sort of blindly optimistic, let's call it that, and perhaps naive and stupid, it depends what you, what you want to call it, but I saw it as sort of just positive optimism. It's all going to work out. I, I can see that what this needs, needs to be to help all these kids that I want to help, but also a bit stubborn, you know, like if it's not working, you just keep, keep charging keep ahead. Hammering, yeah. And I remember I had another client and he was a real sort of business guy and I'd sort of show him the numbers and I remember it like it was yesterday. He'd go, mate, you're fucked. And I was <laughs> like, oh. Anyway, I, I then got home and I was a bit rattled and his wife rang me up who I also trained and she, a long time ago and she said, oh, bloody hell, Glenn's just told me they're a real Ocker family but he's a super savvy business guy he, and... He said, oh, Glenn's just told me what he said to you. You know, you have dinner with him. He pisses all over your barbecue. That's what she said. <laughs> and I, I remember like it was yesterday. And I was like, yeah, well, he did, but he's probably right. You know, because we went down the route of licensing and then we franchised. And franchising actually did work a lot better because you had the direct contact with the coach and that coach had skin in the game. So... We turned things around, but not before we'd sunk way too much money mm. into it. And kids' fitness is a beautiful thing to add on to a personal trainer or a PE teacher, but it's not life-changing amounts of money. You know, you might make an extra thirty or forty, fifty grand maybe at at, at your peak. It's not a, a you're not making a, it's not a McDonald's franchise. So, you know, we were never going to recoup that money. So when I when I launched my online fitness program, I know we're jumping around a bit dumb with the timeline, but when I launched my online fitness program, I had a really sort of hard decision to make that I probably should sell Gecko. And there was one of there was an amazing franchisee who was desperate to buy the whole business because she could sort of see how busy I was getting with other things because this was now post bachelor, and I owed this family nine hundred thousand oh. dollars, 
And so you sold it for like 20% of what it was worth yeah, or what you put Yeah, I sold it for 100 oh, So I put a $100 God. dent in a $900 headache and I then oh. paid the family back $200,000 a year for the next four years once my online program took off. Right, and you also, you also had another gym that you owned, the, the, I, the, the, wood, the Woodshed? The Woodshed, which I still own to this yeah, day. A profitable I, little business, but yeah, not a, yeah, not but, a McDonald's. That, 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 that pays me for me to live, you know, yeah. like that, that wasn't, that didn't have excess cash being spat out. That was, this will allow me to now live with my new wife and nine-year-old, you know, like mm. so there wasn't an excess of money flying around that's for sure so um how, how is how is your mental health at this time like, what, what's it like being 35 years old having worked your worked your ass off yeah. like from from the dark of the morning to the dark of night in this industry you love and you find yourself like three quarters of a million in debt do you know what it should have been worse but it wasn't <laughs> like i always have thought it'll be everything will be okay i where does that come from i don't know maybe my dad a little bit i, I don't know i I mean, I'm, I'm even more... He thinks I'm a bit mad how positive I am and how, you know, how I sort of have this, you know, just keep keep going, everything will sort of work itself out. I mean, I, that being said, never in my wildest dreams that I think it would work itself out as well as it has, both from a family and a, you know, business perspective. Like, I, that's still almost a daily basis, pinch yourself situation. Mm-hmm. But I just... I knew... I knew I had something when it came to fitness and people. I really did. Like I, I could, I could just tell the way I clicked with people. Like very few do. I just hadn't worked out the way, perhaps for that to get that to work. Yeah, just like an unwavering sort of self belief. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. I mean, the the thing that always had sort of was said to me by people that were much smarter than me was, mate, the problem with Gecko is. You know, it's not like McDonald's. You're, you, it's so personal, personality and people based, based on the coach that unless you can clone yourself, it's just never going to work mm. or never going to work to that level. And I, as much as I hated hearing that, they were right. What's happened with my now online fitness business, and I know we're jumping to chapter three, <laughs> is. You, I can clone myself. You know, I can genuinely transport myself into tens of thousands of people's lounge rooms on a daily basis. I can send them advice on water consumption, sleep, recovery, planning, goal setting, whatever. Mm. You know, I, I bring them into my world. They get to know me, my family. You know, it really is an extension of my, my personal family, the 28 family. And technology allows you to do that. And I'm not a technology mm. guy. I can barely send a text message. Yeah, but um, my question would be, and I, I'm probably projecting here on behalf of myself and a lot of people listening to this. So after that gecko incident where you get burnt pretty badly, yeah. Um, why don't you just go, nah, 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 I've tried business, didn't work for me, wasn't for me. I'll, I'm going to go back to what I know, and pay the debt off and then go never again. Well, I sort of went the opposite. Because I sort of, <laughs> my psychology was... Well, now to get to where I want to get to, I'm not starting at zero. I'm starting at negative 800. <laughs> so the next thing's going to have to really be a success or I've got Buckley's of getting to where I want to get to, <laughs> let alone paying this poor family back. You know, like I think David deep down was like, I have no chance of seeing this money. Like how is Sam going to pay me back $800,000? Like it's going to take, a thousand years for Sam to pay me back that mm. much money and to be honest he's probably right in you know 99% of cases did yeah. you do you guys have like a written contract or anything or was it no, just like a gentleman's agreement just a gentleman's agreement fuck th- this is so cool all around it's cool from the family yeah um, and it's it's cool from you as well because yeah, I did have some shady friends that go fuck that don't worry about <laughs> it and I was like no mate you know, no, they didn't is, know the yeah. backstory. they were just like he doesn't have an agreement. I said, no, he doesn't. And they said, they said, oh, well, you don't need to. I said, no, I don't need to. Oh, no, it's, it's a moral yeah. compass thing, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah um, I but it's, I, I find that whole story wonderful on, on, both, on both sides, on their side having the trust in you and then you repaying that trust. Yeah, it's nice when it has a happy end, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> it's cool. I've put, um, Ka- I've put Kanye to sleep. Yeah. Oh, no, he's all right. He's <laughs> very relaxed and comfortable. Okay, so, um, yes, it's, that's a lot of... I don't know. I suppose it's a lot of baggage that you're going into the, the, the Bachelor and then ultimately into this new relationship with. Yeah, well, yeah. when I went into the Bachelor, I was 
I was still bullish about Gecko. Like, almost, I, even though the debt was there, I, I, I shelved it a bit in my mind. Mm. I think probably to, to maintain that positivity and to protect my mental health a little bit, it was just more of a subconscious thing. But I was like, God, if I, focus, if I fixate on that, how am I going to ever turn this business around? I'm not going to be able to get out of bed and you know, charge ahead every morning. It, it's going to really drag me down. But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, when The Bachelor's happening, that's the furthest thing from your mind. Mm. You know, there is so much going on in that world that the debt that you owe this investor way back in Melbourne was not something <laughs> that got a lot of, <laughs> lot of thought, I've got to admit. Yeah, at, at that time, that family must have been like, oh, he's yeah, not worrying about paying us back. He's swanning off for four months well, for a reality TV show. <laughs> they, they might have that thought initially, <laughs> and then they probably saw how big the bachelor was and thought actually this might help Sam eventually be able to pay us back because mm. there's uh he's definitely growing in popularity that's yeah sure. so th so then after the bachelor that's when you started um 28 by Sam Wood yeah so I'd always there was only a couple of online fitness programs in Australia at the time there was Michelle Bridges and there was Kayla it's seen us who sweat oh yeah um, yep and I'd always sort of looked at them and admired them and you know, sort of go, look how many people seem to do their programs and they seem both, both seem fantastic. Very different to me, um, not not better or worse, but just different with their sort of approaches. Um, and then after The Bachelor, you know, social, I'd had no social media following Dom before the show and it just went bananas, you know, went from 20 followers to 250,000 in a number of weeks and so did Snez. And... Well, I'd get DM'd a lot. Can you write me a program? Are you ever going to open a gym in Sydney? Which was never on the cards. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we created 28 and it was, um, it was, it was sort of like, how do we, how do we be different to those other programs? And I looked at those programs and they were still really full on, like very intense workouts 60 minute workouts counting your calories all this stuff that i didn't really believe in i was much more about you actually get far better results and most of the clients i'd worked with were sort of 30 plus females um, or family people you know males as well but family people and understanding even though i wasn't there yet in my sort of late 20s early 30s the challenges that they were facing mm. were time convenience um, the fact that I need some help with my food as well. And so I was all about making sure that if I did launch a fitness program online, it, it catered for as much about what they do outside of their sessions that it does inside their sessions. And we called it 28 because we made the workouts all 28 minutes or less. Why? What was the reason for that? Oh, I just I just think uh, the amount of people I'd, I'd spoken to, that the second they hear it's too much of a commitment, they don't do anything. You don't even get them in the door. So I just knew that that 30-minute psychological barrier was real and if we could do something to make that a bit more comfortable for people, that would be a good way to help people get started. Like, you know, well, why not 29 then? <laughs> great question. I also liked working with people in 28-day blocks. Oh, okay. I, f I found yeah, if weeks. you work with people in four-week blocks, it's long enough to get a result but not so long you become a bit disenchanted and lose your way. So... That it sort of it had two really sort of powerful meanings to me, but you know, not a great deal of thought went into the name Twenty Eight by Sam Wood, and let's launch a website and see what happens. And we launched on when did we launch? First of Feb, twenty sixteen, and we had five thousand people sign up in the first month. Wow! And I was like, holy shit! Wow. Paying fifty dollars a month. Hang on. Yeah, I'm just going to open my calculator yeah. here. Yeah. So what was that? 50 times 5,000. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 250 grand a month revenue and it was me and a few tech guys in an office and I was filming the videos in my gym. Something like that, I suppose you launch it and you hope it's you hope that's going to be the result, like an instant. Oh, but never. Like I'd had yeah. in my head, imagine yeah. if we had 500 sign-ups. Like that would be amazing. By the third month, we had 10,000. Yeah. Yeah, just absolutely exploded. And I'd... So who did you, who did you have on the 28 by Samwood team then? So it was uh, you. So I did it, with the, yeah, I did it with a little tech group. Um, I sort of partnered with them and they, uh, they handled the website side of things. And I, I was very involved in 
how the website needed to look and feel and function. Um, and then I'd create content every day, every week, new workouts. We'd get nutritionists and recipe creators to do the food stuff. We'd get psychologists and people that I'd sort of built in my little network over the years to do some mindset stuff and motivation, goal setting mm. stuff. And um, yeah, we didn't know who our customer was going to be and it ended up being 90% female and lots of mums. So then we launched pregnancy programs and Pilates and postnatal. And then, and I know we're sort of fast tracking, but it, it continued to grow to get, and it sort of, it sort of level, was starting to level out around 20,000 members. And then, um, then COVID hit. And because we were just an at-home program, COVID was, you know, horrific in Australia as it was here in New Zealand and Melbourne was the worst sort of hit from a lockdown perspective. Mm -hmm. But at-home workouts just went bananas. So I was doing live free workouts, streaming to I think 2.8 million Australians did my live workout. I, I got on and thought lockdown was going to last for a fortnight. <laughs> and I said, hi guys, I'm here. I'm going to do live workouts for everybody at 7 a.m. every morning. My wife's rolling her eyes going, we've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old throwing their breakfast cereal against the wall and you're committing to doing a workout at 7 a.m. every morning. I'm saying, hun, lockdown will go for a couple of weeks. This is the right thing to do. People need it. Lockdown lasted for 11 months in Melbourne. Oh, yeah, and, Melbourne had and, it. And it was terribly, just excited it? that at 7 a.m. every morning we had 2.8 million Australians join us for our live workouts, but then a lot of them would join the program afterwards. And, um, yeah, it was just it was an amazing sort of growth period for us and, you know, sort of feel a bit guilty doing well in such a shitty time. But, um, yeah, we were oh, really no, you, well positioned you, to help. You people. can't, though, can you? It's no, like a perfect, I, perfect storm, right place, right thing, right yeah, time. Yeah, and we have a great product and we had a great product. It wasn't, it wasn't a fluke, but... You know, when so many people are losing their jobs and can't work and that kind of stuff, you know, and you're you're actually going you're better. <laughs> yeah, it, it felt a bit, it felt a bit weird. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, it must have felt good that last payment that you made to the family for the gig and stuff. It did. It <laughs> did. I delivered that one with a hand with a, a hand delivered check and dinner, and a big hug and. Uh, and yeah, we we still catch up regularly. Yeah, how good. And then, um, so twenty eight by same what it just kept kept on. Kept on growing post COVID, or is it sort of plateaued uh, out? Yeah, no, we've we've still done really well. I mean, we we peaked in COVID because we did a lot of partnerships with working from home people and that kind of stuff. We did a big partnership with Boopa um, Health Insurance, and uh, so we definitely peaked. I mean, at at one point during COVID, we had one hundred and forty thousand people on the platform at once because we offered a free membership to Boopa members as part of a partnership that we did. So that was sort of a peak of active members on the platform, but. You know, now we've got a team of 30 people that work on the program. I love going to work every day. Um, very, very excited to be here in New Zealand um, to sort of spread the word a little bit. We've, we've already got thousands of New Zealanders who have done the program, but it's just been through organic word of mouth and they've gone on a holiday or their friends in Australia and saw The Bachelor, whatever. I don't even know. There's a myriad of different ways they could have found out about it, but... I'm catching up with a few 28ers this afternoon to have a hug and a coffee and um, and see them here in Auckland, which I'm really excited about. But uh, I just I just thought it was time to get over here properly, get to see the place. Um, I absolutely love what I've seen so far. I'm definitely going to bring the family over next time and uh, do a do a big trip around. But um, yeah, I just I think there's so many similarities between Australia and New Zealand. I know sometimes we can be a bit competitive with each other in a sporting context or whatever it might be, but I feel like that's more from New Zealand towards Australia. It's oh, like, do you? especially with rugby, like yeah, you go to, you well, go to we Australia, never beat no you, one gives so. a shit about rugby in Australia. Um, you oh, there, yeah, well, we've, yeah, we've got so many football codes yeah, that Union yeah. doesn't doesn't <laughs> hold right. the same place as it does over here. That's yeah. for sure. But um, oh, I think the way New Zealand perform in a sporting context for their populations unbelievable yeah you know, you know your cricketers and everything yeah yeah oh, i appreciate that so, oh, so so you had um you had a few offers over the years to sell um the business yeah 20, the phone what? started ringing uh, well, Post COVID? at the very start actually right and as a guy that's not you know i'm i think i'm entrepreneurial in nature but i'm I, i'm not a finance guy so that was a that was all a new learning for me. But 
it was interesting, you know, like people sort of say to you, oh, you should always, you should always know what your exit looks like and you should build your business always to sell your business. Those sort of sentiments didn't really resonate with me. I'm like, why would I, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I love, I <laughs> love this. You know, I'd walk to work with my dog and we'd go into the office and had this great team of 20 people and it's a high vector. I loved it. I still love it. So selling the business wasn't something that I really had planned on doing. Well, I suppose if, if it's if it's humming along and it's growing and you're making a good income and yeah. you're providing a, yeah, a purposeful job for so many people, it's, uh, um, it's exa- a good reason to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But these offers were coming in and they were they were crazy, you know, like like what? Oh, fifty million dollar plus. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how many years had you been doing it at this point? Uh, Five years. Holy shit. So yeah. you took that one. You took the... You know, you didn't no, take No, well, we ended up selling the wow. business for 71. So, yeah, <laughs> crazy. So, but to the right people, and I'm still fully involved. I didn't get $71 million. The business was valued at 71. I took a little bit and... What's I'm, a little bit? Uh, oh, 15. <laughs> Yeah. 15 mil. Yeah. Shit, that's good money. Yeah, amazing. You know. And you, you, so you still have a stake in the company? or Oh, massive. I'm still as involved today as I was then. Nothing's changed. I still go to work every day. I, uh, I only agreed if it meant I stuck around and we, we just... The thing that appealed to me about selling, or it was a merger, was security for my family, but future opportunity to them what we could do with sort of a powerful big brother behind you you know like when you when you've gone from nothing or negative 800 (laughs) to something like that there's a bit of imposter syndrome there's a fear that one day something could happen the bubble could burst and the the dream could be over you know like it doesn't feel real I, i had some really it's funny. I had more anxious moments with money <laughs> than I t- than I perhaps did with this sort of optimistic, youthful enthusiasm when I had none. You know, because I was mm. like, "You have something to lose." It was a really weird um, juxtaposition for me to get my head around. Mm. It's like, "Fuck! Imagine if I lost all of this now, or something happened, or this wasn't real, or I stuff I somehow stuffed this up." Or it was a weird. It was a weird sort of stress that shouldn't have sort of been there. Mm. I should have been relishing in the success and the excitement and the future but I always it did really worry me it's like what if this all sort of especially as I was having kids like I I don't know as my family was growing that sort of stuff became a lot more Mm. top of mind but um but yeah I mean look it it was all about getting some security for my family we paid off our mortgage you know well and truly you know it's been life-changing and um and now it's about you know, seeing what we can do with 28. We've launched a supplement range in Australia, which is launching here in New Zealand in the middle of the year, into, uh, into Woolies and um, Chemist Warehouse uh, called 28 Go. Um, we're looking to see how we can grow 28, first of all, in New Zealand, then hopefully around other parts of the world, um, and yeah, see what else we can do. Because it's just, I don't know, when you, when you get literally... 20 emails a day from people telling you how they've how your program has changed their life and I never take credit for it because it's the people that have got to do the work to have changed their own lives but it's a pretty beautiful feeling when you wake up to those emails every day mm. yeah 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 you're making making um a good living for yourself by doing something that you know is uh creating positive change in yeah, the world. I think that's yeah really exactly good. yeah and th- thanks for being so open and honest about the money stuff I I, get oh, I, didn't, I, did, I normally you know. don't and I yeah. actually I'm sitting here going shit have I spoken too much about money I shouldn't talk about money but no 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 I'm, I'm, I'm I'd rather be open and honest about it I've got, yeah. I've got I mean it was publicly announced mm. you know Sam Wood sells business for 71 million which is not correct so better to probably <laughs> tell the right <laughs> no but so um, I, I guess so, so that day that you get you know your 15 million dollar payout is it um is it less exciting than what you thought it would be? Well, the process of selling a business is so slow. It's not like one day you agree and then the next day you <laughs> shake hands. So I think, I think, the fa- like it took a year and a half from the from when we first had a conversation with this company to when we first did, when we finalised the merger. 
So I think that sucks the life out of you a little bit. But my CEO um, was my be- one of my best friends from school. And he, he went into corporate life. And I remember I caught up with him for a beer when 28 was six months old. And he said, how's your online fitness thing going? And I said, oh, we're going well. And he said, oh, how many members have you got? And I told him the number. It must have been, I don't know, 11,000 or something. And he spat his beer out literally. And he went, and he's a super smart guy. He's like, Woody, that's 500 grand a month turnover. That's $6 million. And I said, I know. And he's like, what? <laughs> and he didn't sort of, he thought I'd made a mistake. And I, he goes, Woody. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the thing with these businesses is you, you spend a lot of money on digital marketing. So the profit margins are not as high as people perhaps think. Well, like. I suppose you can always reinvest. As yeah, we, and, as and we established before, you didn't start with 30 staff members. No. So and, as you grow, and as I was expand. very big on that. You know, we took very little money out of business for the first three years. It was like, no, nah, we're going to make this thing, this can't be a flash in the pan. It can't sort of disappear as quickly as it arrives. That We have to invest in great trainers and build an app because we're just a website and, you know, improve the tech and great customer support and be able to, you know be able to bring this team in house like unless we do all this stuff this thing will you know not not stand the test of time but i had that conversation with with jacko and um about two weeks later the i, I was running the business and i had no idea i was a personal trainer so i was it was it was getting a bit out of my depth but I loved it, and there's there there certain you, things I loved. I yeah, loved and you've Mark. obviously got a good sense of, um, I don't know, just instincts, just following your gut. Well, I got the customer. I've always cared about the customer, and everything was sort of done as being, well, is that what the customer wants and needs? I don't know, and I quite like marketing. So I liked marketing. I was obviously the face of the business, did the PR and bits of the marketing, and was heavily involved with what new content and features we added based on the customer. But I didn't really get tech. God, if someone had said to me, how do you sell a business? I wouldn't have known up from down. So Jacko came across as the CEO and gave him equity in the business um, and we ran it together. So when you say it must have been enjoyable, to do that with one, I mean, he'd been one of my best friends since I was 13 in Tassie. And to do that with him, and then to get a result like that was really special. Yeah, there one of your tears day, and one hugs of your day and, ones. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, how good. And and um, so you pay off your mortgage. What else have you done? You you just got the money invested, or uh, no? We we I've you a call boat. it a batch. <laughs> no, batch. no, a, 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 a beach house. So yeah, right. I love property. I love renovating. We renovated. Snez and I renovated a house together, and we bought a very ugly yellow. Um, Yellow shack or batch down the down the Mornington Peninsula in Melbourne, and we've turned that into. We'll retire down there one day. It's we built a beautiful house down there that the kids can run around in with plenty of space and go to the beach. And yeah, that's mm. our that's our happy place to get away from the city. That's great. Yeah, it must be nice, but like being a being a dad of four, knowing that um, there's a certain level of security for the family moving forward. Yeah, there is, but I'm still very conscious of not giving them too much. Yeah. I, 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 re- I really do think the way my dad was with me helped me so much. Yeah. And you know, everyone's a genius in retrospect. But how do you? Yeah, my I, question would be like, how how do you do that? Because you don't want to. You punish yourself and sneeze, uh, but you you don't want to spoil the kids too much. So I've heard you say you're going to have. Um, uh, like a European holiday, uh, potentially this this winter or the next. Winter. Oh, next year next when year. our little one's three. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, look, you fly everyone business class or put them in economy. Or well, that's a good question. <laughs> like, so I you, don't know if I could have my kids in economy while I was in business class, <laughs> and I'm six foot four, and I think I can afford it. So I don't know. I, I'd love to just tell you it all fly economy, Don, but I'd be bullshitting yeah. you and your audience. So I, I think we'll be in business. Right. What I mean is. I want them to go out and get a job. Yeah, I want yeah. them to know how hard it is to earn 18 bucks an hour. I want them to scrub dishes or work in a cafe. I think that stuff's really important. Mm. You know, like I don't want them to have a $50,000 car for their, like I hate that shit. So I think, you know, tr- spoiling them, them by showing them the world, you know, the thing that is top of my bucket list is taking my kids on a safari. I can't wait till my littlest is six and taking them to africa that's absolutely top of my list but life experiences are perhaps a bit different it doesn't mean we need to stay in bloody five-star hotels and all that kind of stuff but i 
I want to show them the world. I think that'll be really good for them. But um, yeah, I don't think I don't think you know private schools from day one and um, you, you know not having to work for pocket money and that kind of stuff is going to be how it goes. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh, how how good, mate! This is such a good success. Oh, one question I would have about the um, the the company that um, bought the business. Mm. So it, it is hev- heavily personality based. Like they're buying and they're investing in you. It's twenty eight by yeah, seven. Yeah, that's more. very true. Yeah. What, what what happens? Say if you and me go out after this, um, we, get on, <laughs> we get on the cans. Now I get a video of you doing a doing a bubbler. Oh, you know? I knew you were going to say that <laughs> I got hit by a bus or something. Oh, I know. Oh, we're having no, a bender. All oh, no, right. No, something outright. <laughs> what's what's, a, what's a bu- oh, a bubbler? You know, <laughs> the young you know NRL player, Todd Carney guy. Oh, so, yeah. he, so he urinated and got the stream so high that he got in his own oh, mouth. I can and, guarantee. You there'll be no bubbles from me. <laughs> okay, but well, like, hypothetically speaking, so oh, th- well, this is a new term that I learnt when we were in the boardroom to having these sale negotiations. It's called key man risk or key person risk, and that is we pull the value of your business down if it's too heavily based on you. And it's more, I mean, they I don't think they thought I might do something like that. You know, if you do anything incriminating or you get hit by a Car or you know, well, what, you're flying business and your kids are in economy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a bad dad. What? Well, yeah. What happens? <laughs> so, like, there is a lot of pressure, obviously, yeah. around that. But I think because of the deal that we did, and because of the fact that I'm staying as involved with the business now as I was before the deal, that gave them a lot of peace of mind, and it was exactly what I wanted to do. I, I think, you know, like, they'll ask you, "What will you do, Sam, after the deal?" And it's like, well, what do you mean? This is my job. I'm not, you know, it's 28 by Sam Wood. The Sam Wood's not going anywhere. Mm. So I think when they hear that, it gives them a little bit of comfort. But they always use it as a negotiating tactic. You know, oh, your business would be worth X, but it's mm. probably only worth half X because you're about to go and do a bubbler, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, though. I, su- I suspect you won them over in the boardroom. And in a lot of ways, it's a, a huge, huge scale of that family that you talked about earlier, the, the Gecko family. Yeah, I'd never thought about that analogy, but probably. Yeah, I mean, buying into the man. Well, there is that, yeah. I mean, they, they say they invest in founders, you know, like the business can look good on paper, but, you know, the person who's got it to where it's gotten to and needs to continue to get it mm. there is, is who we invest in. And my now boss... Um, is a wonderful guy, very entrepreneurial, and and he he likes that in me. Like he, he compliments mm. me on that, and sort of says, "Mate, I love that you you care so much. I love that you're a risk taker. I love that you know the drive that you've got, and it doesn't seem to have waned at all. Even though the fact that you now come into our office, so like mm. there's you know we we get on really well. Yeah, and the, I mean the fact that you're in New Zealand now, trying to grow the business even further, I think that speaks volumes. You know. You maybe just as driven, if not more driven now than what you were pre-sale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when when you start selling a business, it's actually the that that eighteen months was the worst because the advice you get given is don't do anything too radical while people are trying to buy you mm. because it sort of it could distract you from the way the business has been growing or you don't really want to try anything new in case it doesn't work. And I hate that. That sort of goes against every grain in my being. So now that that deal is well and truly behind us and we can focus on what next, I love that. With, you know, with a bit of a safety net, without, you know, it, it, I love that. It's fantastic. Mm. What, what would your advice be to anyone that's listening to this that is um, from the perspective of someone that's um, been in business and has had a, a failed business and yeah. also a wildly successful business, someone that's thinking about starting something? Well, look, I, I always used to listen to, you know, business podcasts and read business books. I was always really interested in other people's success stories. And I was I was a little bit cynical because I was like, oh, it's all very well for the, you know, your Richard Bransons of the world to say, you know, you've just got to not focus on the money and the money will come. I'm like, oh, that's all very well for you to say. You're a billionaire. <laughs> or, or, you know, like you've just got to keep – if your first idea fails – it might be your second idea or your third idea. I'm like, oh, you know, again, easier said than done. But both are so true. Mm. You know, like if you focus on the bit, the right f- facets of the business, it will become valuable. And if your first idea, like mine, wasn't, you know, the 
the success that you'd hoped that it had been or you visualised it was going to be, don't give up, you know. And, and, you know, I was in a position where not many people would have begrudged me, I think, for giving up and, you know, taking the safe bet and going back to personal training and grinding it out for the next 40 years. But I don't know, I just... You knew there was something more. Well, I hoped. I hoped hoped and there was a bit of me that that thought there was and, yeah, Mm. it's panned out really well, thank God. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, you're anyone that's a detractor of you, which I can't imagine there is anyone, but if there is, it'd be s- simple to say, oh, you know, he was on The Bachelor, then he capitalised on his profile. To say, but yeah. you, you look at the, the previous 20-odd years behind that, like it was all sort of building up to this moment. All the personal training, the gecko stuff, the, the lessons that you learned along yeah. the way. Like uh, it was the, a very long apprenticeship. True. I mean, there was some luck. There was some great timing, um, and I don't, take that for granted I, i'm so grateful for it but i think the thing that has always i think the thing that helped me so much was people do these reality shows and then they get some popularity and some notoriety and they just go what can i do i'll launch that business i have kept doing what i've always done mm. and in particularly in this explosion of online programs and fitness influencers most of them have no idea what they're talking about. So the fact that I've got so much experience is so helpful with working with people. And I think people now have this choice. Where do I spend my money with an online program? Or choose, which personal trainer do I choose? You know, half of them got their accreditation on the back of a cereal box or they're an influencer with 50,000 followers but don't know their ass from their elbow. And you've got to be really careful to who you listen to. So I think the fact that I've trained so many people, I've been to university and all this kind of stuff, I think... I think people can see that and it and they see that it's genuine and i'm just doing what i've always done just now to more people but yeah it's it's a good way of putting it dom it was Mm. definitely a long apprenticeship yeah it's a hell of a story (laughs) um you know i love a success story like this especially when it happens um you know sort of later in life not not later in life you know sort of getting towards middle age yeah i think it's really cool would you describe yourself as an aussie battler (laughs) is it what does an aussie battler mean and uh Someone that keep, keeps giving it a crack and gets knocked uh, down and gets back up, or yes, is it a derogatory term? Well, it can be. A, it can also. It can be a bit derog. Like Aussie Battler can be. Never seems to find a way to get ahead. Oh, okay. You know, like so. I, I, you could use it in the other context in some cases. You know, like keeps having a crack, but it's more a bit derogatory. So, I probably was an Aussie Battler, and I've I've now hopefully broken. You know, th- broken through that, but. Yeah, I mean that pers- oh, no, we're, we're, that persistence part definitely has been a key. Yeah, yeah, there's some some great lessons in there that I think anyone can use. Persistence being the key one. Yeah, and definitely not an Aussie battler. There's, <laughs> there, there's never been an Aussie battler that, that looks similar to David Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> hey, mate, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast oh, today. It's been, it's been great. It's been wonderful to pick your brains. And um, even though I never saw your season of, of The Bachelor, um, just fascinating insights into the reality TV and business. So, oh, mate, thank uh, you for having me. I mean it. I've... Uh, I've never listened to your podcast, but I promise I will moving forward and I'll go back and listen to some. And uh, I've, when we were asking who should we talk to when we go to New Zealand, you're one of the first names that popped up. So thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And all the best for the future. Cheers, mate.